three o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started with this, our final session of this very symposium. Thank you, all of you, for coming and being here with us today. Um, we've been a lot of great presentations, we're looking forward to another one this hour. Um, so I'll go ahead and introduce our presenter, and then we'll turn the time over to him. Um, we'll be hearing today from Brother John S. Thompson. He has received degrees from BYU and UC Berkeley in the Hebrew Bible, and is currently completing a PhD at the University of Pennsylvania in Egyptology. His research, research interests include ancient Egyptian priesthood and iconic, I, iconography. There we go. This kind of time. Iconography, as well as ancient familial and social structures and laws related to covenants such as inheritance and adoption. John teaches full time at the Orem, Utah LDS Institute and is married to Stacy Keller of Orem, Utah. They have nine children, and their oldest son and daughter are currently serving LDS missions in Monterey, Mexico, and Houston, Texas, respectively. So I'm painfully aware that this is the only pagan uh, session. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, but I think we can learn a lot from doing some comparative studies a little bit. So. Um, so efforts to explore uh, corollaries between Egyptian temple rituals and the Old Testament temple tradition often conflate all of Egyptian history and all the rituals and everything into, into one single whole. Um, but this study was going to, is going to kind of focus, um, this presentation will focus mostly on uh, the earliest uh, temple rituals. Uh, this, this is largely a chapter of my dissertation. Uh, which looks at the non-royal tombs that, all, that surround the pyramids in Giza and Saqqara. And many of these tombs predate um, the pyramid texts that, that where we get some of the initial uh, views of Egyptian religion. Um, and so I'm looking at the non-royal tombs and all the depictions of the priests and the, you know, what's going on inside those tombs, focusing on the priesthood of those non-royal tombs. And um, they, they date anywhere from 2600 BC to 2100 BC. So, um, you know, several of these, you know, predate Abraham, and uh, uh, and by taking, and I'll just show you some pictures here. Uh, what typically happens is when you get toward the the, the central, um, you know, offering area, the sacred area of these non-royal tombs, you'll see usually you'll see a depiction of the the uh, the tomb owner on a chair sitting before a t an offering table. And then outlined there is a bunch of priests, you know, coming before him and doing different rituals. Every tomb is different. This is what's kind of frustrating. You know, like you have this tomb, which is one of the larger tombs in Egypt, and it you know, has several priests kind of lined up there for us to look at. Um, and then you get some that look like, you know, this, where you just get a few scattered, you know, rituals. Um, and then this one, even fewer. Uh, and sometimes you'll see some examples where we only have like uh, two priests, you know, standing before the tomb owner in this situation. So trying to figure out what they're all, what they're all doing, you know, is, is difficult. But but what I've done in, in my dissertation is combined all of these um, these tombs to see if there's some kind of a pattern going on. And and by synthesizing all the tombs and and, and seeing the sequence, and, and because the, what's kind of hard is that sometimes you'll get a a, a, a priest who's sensing who's like burning incense at the beginning of the sequence, and you go to another tomb, and suddenly he's at the end of the sequence, and you're like, what? You know, I thought he was at the beginning, but now he's at the end. But then when you when you synthesize them all together, you realize that they're actually two different sensing ceremonies. There's one at the beginning, one at the end, and actually there's one in the middle, uh, as we'll see here. As I synthesize these, and I, I try to keep them in, in you know the same order that they appear in the tombs, and then combine them all together, surprisingly, the result, the, the, the overarching sequence um, was very similar, almost exactly the same sequence that shows up in the, the later pyramid texts uh, that are known as the offering list ritual. Um, and so, uh, so this is significant because this is letting us know that the pyramid texts, even though they're the most ancient religious texts in the world, uh, come from an earlier tradition because we now we have these non-royal tombs that are dated even before that, that have that same tradition in it albeit in pictorial form, not in text form. And so, uh, anyway, so what's kind of interesting, I think, for today is that as you combine this, these uh, priests together and you look at the sequence, 
um, you begin to realize something interesting, and that is that the sequence of these priests um, can fit quite nicely in the Old uh, Testament temple tradition. Uh, now, the Old Testament temple tradition, if you talk to biblical scholars, will tell you that that tradition is a very late development in the history of Israel. That uh, the complex rituals that we see depicted in the book of Exodus and, and or you know, described in Exodus and Leviticus and, and Numbers, you know, these, ritual, um, uh, these rituals are, are very late development. Um, some you know, argue post 600 BC, right? So during the exile or thereafter. Um, but what this shows us, that you have these ancient Egyptians who have a very similar ritual sequence dating to 2600 BC and thereabouts, so that you could effectively then say that the Israelite temple tradition could have a much, much earlier um, you know, origin. And so, um, so that's kind of what I'm looking at. And since these predate Abraham, then it's significant for us in Latter-day Saints that the Pearl Gate Christ lets us know that the Egyptians, you know, that the early patriarchs from Adam and Noah, they all had, you know, these, these rituals in their fullness from the beginning. Um, but when you look at the Old Testament by itself, right, the early patriarchs are, are all they're doing basically is offering a sacrifice on the altar. And so that's why modern scholars think that the temple rituals in the early parts of the Old Testament are very simple and then they get more complex as we get later. But again, um, I think this is an indicative of, of having very complex rituals very early. Um, and so I think it's significant uh, for biblical studies for that purpose. Okay. Um, so scriptural... Uh, so what we'll go on then is look at the actual sequence of rituals and what's going on here. So the first priest that we see um, in the tombs and in the pyramid text, the first ritual described in the pyramid text, is this initial libation. Typically you'll see two priests like you see here in these examples, or you might have one priest standing by himself just pouring. Um, but, um, but this initial libation, according to the pyramid text, is the, um, the sequence um, states, pyramid text state that it's performed as a purification against those who speak evil, so quote, speak evil of the king's name. Okay, so the idea is that, is that we're going to do an initial ritual to kind of cleanse evil, right? To kind of get rid of evil before we start entering into all the rituals uh, that are part of this uh, uh, sequence. And this is pretty standard for most religions, you know, kind of have some kind of a libation at the beginning of a, of a ritual um, sequence or, or just any kind of ritual. Um, all right, but it's, it's an idea of casting out evil in some way. Um, okay, so that's our first uh, ritual sequence. The second one is an initial sensing, um, where you have, so you see the, the priests, I guess I can use this. Uh, you have these priests right here who are doing the, the libation, followed by this priest here who's holding, uh, oh, he's holding, um, Incense balls in it, and then he could, you know, use the cup to snuff it out if he needs to. The top of the cup. Um, so you see one there. This one's kind of broken, so you can't quite see it, but you can tell it from the text that right here that it's burning incense. And then again, another example here, following that initial uh, libation. And the initial sensing, uh, in this instance, the pyramid texts simply say, you know, let the smell of Horus's eye, um, and Horus's eye is a reference to any kind of offering. But let the smell of this offering, the incense offering, adhere to you. So this idea of becoming um, you know, adhered to with this beautiful smell. And I think it was uh, Dan Belknap earlier, I didn't get to see it, but he actually spoke about incense and, and how it's kind of a liminal or transitional moment where you move from one state to another state using incense as kind of you know, helping you get through that. Um, all right, so the third sequence or third ritual in the sequence. This is kind of a group of uh, rituals, this uh, small meal offering. And this small meal begins with a, a washing, okay? And it's called the opening of the mouth. 
And in this uh, ritual, the, um, the mouth, along with, uh, well, I'll just read to you some of the text here. So from the pyramid text, we, uh, this, this water that they're using is combined with natron, like a baking soda material, so it looks a little bit milky. And so when they apply it, um, it they, they call it milk, right? So this idea of, of drinking milk. So the pyramid text says that it um, begins with the washing with kebu or cool, cool water that is mixed with natron pellets, giving the water the appearance of milk. This milk, quote, will part the mouth of the recipient whose mouth is like the mouth of a calf on the day it's born. Right? So this is this idea of a, a newly born person or a newly born calf, so a young uh, calf, young child, right? And, uh, and he's drinking this milk. And then later, the, the pyramid text refers this to the milk of the mother, right? Um, and so he, it, it basically commands the, the king to drink the milk of his, of his mother, Isis. And, um, and so, so we have this uh, initial cleansing of the mouth and this milk drinking kind of combined as one ritual. Then um, a flint tool is used to touch the mouth as if to, like if it's a statue, you, you use you know, a tool to carve it, and they would actually use these tools as a ritual implement, and they would touch the mouth so that the, the statue could breathe and, and come alive. And so the idea of, of opening the mouth, so now that you can partake of this little meal that we're about to give you, right? And so, so we have this uh, idea, then the, and then of course there's this meal uh, depicted. And so here, for instance, this first fellow here, he's the um, representing the meal, but right here, this little circle is a natron ball, and, and this little vessel he is holding in, in other scenarios is typically um, the vessel that's used to make this natron solution. You pour water in it and put the natron balls in it. And, and then in addition to the natron solution, you see this little offering table here with, with the uh, offerings of bread and wine and other kinds of things. So this is the initial meal that, that is being given. <laughs> These three characters here, this is called the Henu gesture, and it, it in later periods of Egypt, it's kind of associated with this idea of jubilation, right? This is a joyful moment. And it's kind of hard to tell what's going on, really, with these, with these characters. But um, here's another example from another tomb. You have the initial, um, this is, you have the initial libation here, and this would be the, the, the libation associated with the opening of the mouth. And then you have those three characters way back here. The characters in the middle, um, the character who's usually standing with his hand out like this, this is just a simple offering gesture. And so these priests here, the one who's holding his hand out and the ones who are holding this, these scrolls, that's what these are, they're, they have these scrolls open, uh, these are referred to as lector priests and they're kind of the officiators during the ritual. So these guys are actually doing the ritual and, and then this priest here is um, offering, you know, gesturing, saying here is an offering to you. And then these guys who are holding the, the scrolls represent um, the, the reading of the ritual itself. And the, the reason why they appear three times is because this is a, a plurality of rituals, right? Or lots of words that they're speaking. Okay, so, so that's what we have indicated at, at this point. Again, you see the similar thing here. We have the small meal offering, followed by the offering gesture and the guy who's reading the ritual, and then the three indicating the jubilee. But, but these are kind of indicative of the opening of the mouth ritual in the non-royal tombs. You don't ever see, by the way, you don't ever see actually anybody having their, their mouth actually open. Um, you don't see a priest, for instance, touching the mouth of a, of a statue or a mummy or whatever, um, at least in these Old Kingdom examples. Um, but what we do have, so this is the, uh, the classic uh, uh, reference for opening the mouth rituals um, from Otto. Um, it, you know, shows this particular scene is, is actually a part of the opening of the mouth ritual. This is from very late New Kingdom time period, but you see the same characters. You have one four in here. You have the offering gesture. The knee, this is actually three priests. You know, they're kind of side by side. Um, so it's, it's the same characters here are depicted here. Um, and then we actually there's only two examples where we actually see the words opening of the mouth. So um, right here. Uh, Wepet Ra, so this is open and mouth, and this is the priest's name, or not name, his title, he's a, a Weti priest, or a, what's referred to as an embalmer, but I'm not sure if that's what he's doing here. 
But what he, the gesture he's making here is a variation of this gesture. So now we can tie very closely the opening of the mouth uh, text to this gesture uh, in all the tombs. Okay, so, so far, right, we have the initial libation and then initial sensing. And then we have this opening of the mouth where the mouth is washed with water and then he's given a little meal to eat, okay? The next ritual that kind of shows up um, in the sequence is an anointing ritual. And the classic anointing pose in ancient Egypt is a little pinky sticking out, okay? So you can see that um, right here. And it helps that it says, um, you know, where at right here, which, which means to anoint the head. And understand that when you look in Egyptian non-royal tombs, they'll have seven different oils that they use at this ritual. And each oil has its own name and its own purpose, but the idea is that they're associated with the seven openings of the head. So you have the two ears, the two nose, the mouth, and the two eyes, so that's seven. And so they're, they're anointing actually the head, the different parts, the different openings in the head so that you can see and breathe and, you know, and hear and those kinds of things. So that's the initial, uh, that's the anointing ritual. And then this indicates right here, it's for anointing him. That's what this oil he's carrying. These are standard oil jars in Egyptian iconography. And here it's indicated that he's actually bringing this oil to anoint the person. Okay. And let's see if there's any text associated with this. I mean, the pyramid text just simply mentions also that it is, uh, yeah, it's just an anointing. Okay. Uh, well, the pyramid text at this point have it, for instance, Unus's pyramid text, which is the earliest pyramid text that we have, indicates oil, oil, where should you be? You on Horus's head, right? Where should you be? You were on Horus's head, but I will put you on this Unus's head. Right? So Horus is the god, Unus is his earthly manifestation. And so the oil that's been on the head of Unus and the or head of Horus, I'm going to put it on the head of Unus. And you will glorify him under you. So you oil you know, are going to glorify Unus. Right? Again, the head is the emphasis in the, in the uh, pyramid text. OK. Um, and by the way, I need to make a correction here, because I indicated that if you look at the, uh, the article in the book, I said that whereas it does not actually appear at this point in the pyramid text, that after publishing this, I found it, it does appear um, in one of the later pyramid texts uh, right at this very point. So, so write that down. And just it. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, so the next rite after being anointed is a clothing ritual. And so we have, all we have is these priests handing two strips of cloth. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of hard to tell what's going on here. And, um, but um, when you read the pyramid text, it kind of helps you understand what is going on. So what it states here in the pyramid text is that um, in PT81, the goddess of linen or weaving you know, is summoned to awake and describes her as the one whom the, whom the made-up woman receives, right? So this idea, this, this goddess of cloth and, and weaving, right, she's going to come and make you up, right? And she adorns the great one in the sedan chair. That a made-up woman receives the linen personified as a goddess and it adorns implies something that one wears. Um, Teddy's pyramid states, your mother Tides will clothe you, linking this goddess and by extension the linen that she represents explicitly to the idea of clothing. Pepi, the first pyramid, is even more explicit. It says, Ho, Pepi, receive your dazzling garment. Receive your bleached garment on you. Get dressed in Horus's eye. Again, Horus's eye is the offering of the linens. Get dressed in this offering of linen from Taiit town, right? From the, from the place where God, the goddess Taiit, the goddess of linen, where she comes from. And, um, and so, so again, we're tying this very explicitly to the idea of clothing. And Middle, Middle Kingdom texts actually do, at this point, call this a clothing ritual, not a, uh, a, a presentation of two linen cloth rituals. Um, okay, so that's the, the next one. After this particular ritual, we have another sensing that shows up in many, so you can see you have the, uh, the, the linen ritual here, followed by a, another censer. Um, so you're burning incense here. 
And that's all we need to say about that. We'll come back to all these in a minute. After this, then we have a great meal offering. So we have the small meal offering with the, the uh, opening of the mouth. Now we have a great meal. And, and so this is, these two, uh, this one in the next picture is actually just one wall from the tomb of Kagemi, 6th dynasty. Um, and, and this wall, you can just see, is just full. I mean, you have the, the, the fellows doing the rituals here, but from here down through all these, and then here's the, the next, uh, to the right of that on the same wall, you, you get more of these priests who are just bringing food. Okay, this is a massive uh, meal that they're gonna have. And, uh, and so this is part of that great meal offering. And, and, and in the pyramid text, it indicates that, the, at least in the meat offering section, the first, the first uh, meat offerings that you're making is um, uh, the haunch of, a, of an ox, right? So, so this foreleg, that's what you see these guys carrying here, the foreleg. And then, and then the meat offerings in the pyramid text ends with geese, ducks, and pigeons. And interestingly, in Kongemi's tomb, he has the foreleg at the front, and then he has, followed by, it's kind of hard to see, because this is so tiny, but he's got geese here in these little cages, ducks in these cages, and then pigeons in this cage. So it, it matches, you know, exactly what we have in the pyramid text. Um, so again, tying these things together. And by the way, you, you may not be aware of this, but this is why this is significant is because the Egyptologists for the longest time used to believe that the king had his own privileged afterlife, right? The king was the only one who got to go into the heavens with Ray. The common people would live on the earth in their tombs forever. And what this is showing is that's not the, that's not the case. That, that the common people have the same rituals inside their tombs that the king has in his pyramids. They all are expecting to have a glorious afterlife in the heavens with Ray. Okay, so, um, all right. This is followed by another clothing ritual, but in this case, they're clothing uh, the initiate with all kinds of kingly regalia. Um, so, for instance, uh, in the pyramid text, it indicates explicitly. Um, Let's see. Pyramid text says um, that um, okay. So in the in the, the list of this ritual in the in the tomb of or so the pyramid text of Unis, it consists of bestowing scepters and staves, uh, other insignia uh, that all kind of indicate the king's power to govern, and that you know what govern is is used. Again, the, the recipient is commanded to get dressed four times, uh, including in Teddy's period of text, they, they get dressed in a leopard skin, a kilt, and sandals. Um, and this stands in contrast, obviously, to the initial clothing, which was just a simple garment, that was mentioned, um, the, a bleached garment. Um, so now we have the bleached garment, and then now on top of that, we have this kingly uh, regalia put on there. So after the bestowal of insignia, uh, we now have the closing rituals, okay? And the closing rituals begin with this, what's referred to as the bringing of the foot and, or the reversion of offerings. You see this uh, priest right here, he's got a little broom in his hand. And, and what the idea is that as we brought all these offerings, we had this huge feast, you know, it's been a great time, it's time to go home, the party's over, right? And so they're carrying all the offerings out and what they do with the offerings, the reason why it's referred to as a reversion, is that you, know, you present the offerings to the, the god or the deceased, and then you take those offerings and you, and you take them down to lower temples and lower, you know, uh, uh, you know dead, the non-royal dead. And, and it's the idea of a distribution of the goods among the people. Um, and so that's what they're doing is they're picking up these offerings and carrying them out. And he's, you know, sweeping the floor to make it pristine, getting it ready for the next day when they do these rituals again. Um, and so that's that's kind of what's going on here. Um, this is the end of an offering text or offering list uh, tablature, and you can see the same two characters: one sweeping and one's actually turning. You see how he's reversed. These guys are all facing, you know, which direction here? That way, and these two fellows are facing the opposite direction because they're walking out. And the party's over. We're leaving. And, um, and, and so, and he's standing up with the goods in his hands. And again, up here the text tells me he's reversed, it's a reversion of offerings and this is bringing the foot. Um, okay. Then, uh, after the, 
this, we have a final, uh, two final libations and a sensing. You don't see the two libations all the time, so here's one, here's one, and then this one has two. And, and this second libation is the same libation that began the whole process. Okay, so we have uh, what's referred to as a zach libation. That was the first one, and it's that initial pouring and get rid of evil. And then at the end of the sequence, we have another one, kind of the closing libation. Um, and then the libation right before this one is another one of those natron washings. So this is, um, so we had that first washing in, with the small meal, now we have this final washing um, at the end of the ritual sequence. Okay. Well, and then they were followed by another, the third and final sensing. And I should indicate on the, the final sensing that the text changes now in the pyramids. The first two sensings are the same. The third sensing says this, uh, so the pyramid texts repeat the same script associated with the previous two sensings. However, some material is added. Unlike the previous two sensings, the text indicates that this third sensing is of great purity and is to become high and big, and the king is to become pure through it. So the use of great, high, and big magnify this last sensing and its purpose in comparison with the earlier sensing. This may indicate a progression as the recipient attains a higher or a greater degree of purity than before. So we'll come back to that in just a second. All right, and then um, one of the last rituals, again, the closing rituals, as they're, as they're wrapping things up and they're walking out, one of the last things they'll do is they'll take redware, so red colored pots, and they'll puncture them or smash them. And actually write on the pot the names of all their enemies. So this is like, you know, voodoo, okay? You know, write my name on this voodoo doll and stab it, you know, or whatever. And they're going to write the names of their enemies on these red pots and then smash it. And the idea is that you have power over your enemy. Yeah, you, you have become powerful. And, and no enemy can, can touch you or you. Okay, so the smashing of redware is one of the concluding rituals. Then, um, and I'll skip that. Then, this surprised me because this is not in the pyramid text. But in three of the non-royal tombs, the last character at the end of the sequence is this little guy here carrying a little bag in, in his hand. And um, his title is right here. It's like a little, it's like a little medallion. And this is actually an ancient seal. So it's got a little necklace that you would hang around the neck. And then a little seal, you know, with probably the king's name on it, something like that, where you can stamp, you know, things with it. Um, and so Hatenti is this title, this is a sealer. That's the last person in the, the ritual sequence in the non royal tombs. And what his purpose is, is really difficult to determine. So, um, uh, one example, Hetemti, a sealer, may relate to the offerings that have been brought themselves. Because there is, there is one example I found in the, in the uh, tomb of um, Kaya Khufu from the fourth dynasty, so one of the earlier tombs, where they're bringing all these, you know, goods for these rituals that they're going to do, and it mentions in there that uh, these rituals, these, they're, that they're presenting, quote, presenting sealed offerings containing festival oil. And um, and there was another one I can't remember what, but anyway, it mentions that these things were sealed. And the idea is, of course, that all the offerings have the name of the king sealed upon them. It's, as it's you know, it belongs to him. It's a gift he's given. Uh, to these non royal people. So it could be the sealer is kind of the guy who goes around stamping everything, saying this is the king's, the king's putting the king's name on something. Right? So putting names on things are really important in temple rituals, and that's kind of what's going on here. Um, and uh, another idea of why a sealer is here at the end uh, can come from this, this example where he's in reverse pose. So he's turning away as if to walk away. And in the New Kingdom periods, at the very end of all the rituals, after you've seen the god and you've, you've uh, washed and anointed and clothed the god and raised the god, you, you put the god back into his temple shrine, you close it, and then you slap a bunch of clay on the, you know, the closure and seal it. And so he's the last guy to, to walk out of the, uh, the, the ritual sequence. So maybe he's there for that kind of purpose of sealing the god back into his holy of holies as he leaves the ritual. Um, so that's another example of why he might be there. The third one, and this one has a little more evidence to it, is right here. Um, this, these two hieroglyphics, this is the hieroglyphic for God, and this is the hieroglyphic for book. So this is, these are sealers of the divine book. And um, so what in the world is that? Well, 
um, from the tomb of Nihetepetah, which is where these guys come from. Um, they're related, as I mentioned, to the Majat Net Netcher, the divine document. Some tomb biographies of the Old Kingdom contain statements of the deceased regarding knowledge of such documents. Sealing, or for example, the tomb of uh, T declares, I am initiated in all the secrets of the house of the divine documents. And so this idea that these documents contain the secrets, the mysteries of the house, right? And that they've been initiated into these these uh, divine documents, uh, or to the, the rituals of these that are in these divine documents. Um, since sealing as a general practice was used to guarantee the identity of the sender and authenticate the, uh, the contents of private, private legal and official documents, a sealer in this context may provide an official stamp of approval on the rituals by which the deceased was initiated into the secrets of the document, having the legal status of a sealed document when you go to John Welsh for all kinds of information about sealed documents and their legal purpose. All right, so those are the rituals. We've got seven minutes to kind of tie this into the Old Testament. Hopefully, you probably, many of you have already kind of made some connections yourself. Um, but here's, here's the sequence again, uh, working from the top down. And uh, what I, when you look at it, what, what you kind of notice is some patterns. Okay, that are going on here. Number one, you have, again, as I mentioned, that initial Zach libation followed by a sensing, and then toward the end you have the same thing. Okay, kind of as a closing um, uh, ritual. But then you have these other rituals that seem to follow that. Um, so why are these separated, as it were, from these other closing rituals here? Uh, we'll talk about that in just a second. Another thing you'll notice is that you have kind of a, another duality of rituals. You have a small meal that begins with an opening of the mouth, washing, followed by anointing, and then a, a being clothed in plain linen. Then you have another sensing which kind of breaks up these two you know, segments, followed by a great meal offering and insignia clothing. So, so you have plain clothing, followed by more elaborate clothing. You have a small meal, followed by a great meal. And so this indicates, or seems to indicate, right, some kind of a progression here. We're going from a small, plain, to more elaborate, grand, and big. Okay? So that's one thing to think about. Um, and then these other rituals, again, th this, this whole segment here are the clothing rituals, where you have, uh, we're, we're taking the goods away, um, we, we have a final washing, and then, um, again, the smashing everywhere and the ceiling at the very end. Okay, so take all of these now. Let's go to the Old Testament temple. This is a very crude, you know, uh, mock-up of the, the tabernacle, I guess, but you, know, you can make some connections with Solomon's temple as well. Um, as you know, the temple has two main parts. There's the courtyard, and then there's the temple itself. And I think uh, we need to begin to really wrap our minds around the idea that I think we have this cultural belief that the temple is actually an Aaronic temple in the Old Testament. I, I disagree with that completely. I think the temple should be understood as Melchizedek. You know, and that the courtyard is ironic. Um, I think in later periods, in the Second Temple period, things get a little bit more mixed up. But when you read when you read the Old Testament and you look at more of the First Temple period concepts, it's only the high priest that actually goes into the temple, and the regular priests serve outside. That changes a little bit in later times. Uh, so it's the high priest who's in the temple. It's the prophets who are in the temple. So when you read prophetic material like Ezekiel, and Isaiah, and Jeremiah, they're in the temple. Um, so prophets are in the temple, this, um, the high priest is in the temple, and the kings are in the temple. So David and Saul and others seem to be going before the ark inside the temple and using high priestly paraphernalia, like, like the, uh, the Urban Thummim, it seems, that uh, um, you know, Saul and, and you know, David used it or not. But anyway, we have kings you know, doing all these things as well. So, so you have this division. And Malachi, the end of the Old Testament, kind of tells us that there is a major division, right? Malachi says that there's going to be a messenger who shall prepare the way. And then another messenger, right? The Lord shall come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. So now we have the Lord, the Melchizedek high priest, who is of the temple, and the messenger and the covenant is associated with the temple. And you got the preparatory, you know, uh, messenger, the Aaronic messengers in the, in the courtyard. Okay, so that's one little thing we need to 
And then, and then by the way, I mean, if you want to make this, equate this to our modern temples, the room that's in front of the veil and the room behind the veil, right, the terrestrial and celestial rooms, are Melchizedek rooms. And everything else outside those two rooms, anciently, would have been outside of the temple. So in our temples, you don't go into the temple until you enter the terrestrial room, really, um, at least from an ancient perspective. So that's something to kind of keep in mind as you try to put things in, into order. Hence, the things that are in this room, the holy place, um, are probably, should be associated with Melchizedek priesthood, not Aaronic priesthood. So there's a table, for instance, of showbread. Sometimes I hear in LDS circles that that's sacrament, you know, as we understand it. But the sacrament is an Aaronic priest ordinance, right? And therefore, it would belong outside the temple. So this is a Melchizedek feast. So what is that, right? That's the great question. Egyptians kind of have this idea, so we're, we're going to look at that now. So to put these pieces together now, um, I think we begin to see some corollaries. Uh, so we have initial libation, and uh, and and although uh, we don't have any mention that I know of, maybe some of you can help me with this, of uh, an initial libation explicitly mentioned in the daily offering programs of the Israelite temple, uh, but we do have mention of ritual libations in the Old Testament. For instance, 1 Samuel 7, 6 states they gathered together to Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, we have sinned against the Lord and Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mizpah. Okay, so there's one example. And then it's interesting because it says that they poured out water before the Lord because one has sinned against the Lord and the Egyptian pyramid text says that... Um, that you're pouring out the water because one has spoken against the king. Um, and so you kind of have a little bit of an interplay on some of the ideas there of why we're pouring out the water. Um, in the Old Testament tradition, pouring out water signifies lowliness, repentance, and the hopeful dissipation of sin, like water seeping into the earth, as seen in passages of 1 Samuel 1.15, 2 Samuel 14.14, 14, Job 11.16, in Psalms 22, 14, 62, 8. Um, that's 22, 14 in chapter 62, verse 8. Likewise, Jeremiah uses temple imagery. He pleads with Israel to lift up their hands towards God and pray in the beginning of the watches. The beginning of the watches. Right? They should pour out thine heart like water before the face of the Lord. This emphasizes their need to repent as the first thing that one does at the beginning of the watch when approaching the Lord. The pouring out of the blood of the sacrifices upon the earth as water, Deuteronomy 12, 24 says, may have some connection. So this idea that you're, it, the pouring out may have something to do with the altar sacrifice. It's the beginning of the journey, the beginning of the watch as you're heading back to God. You've got to repent. You've got to pour out your heart like water. And they actually poured out blood like water from, you know, at the altar. Okay. The opening of the mouth... Okay, um, we recall, of course, that from the book of Exodus that we not only have an opening of the uh, the, the uh, of washing and anointing of the of the, the Aaronic priests in the courtyard, um, but there's also a small meal mentioned in Exodus in relationship to that initial opening of the mouth uh, that they go through, um, followed by you know again we mentioned the whole anointing. So and then they're clothed in plain linen in the courtyard. So you could then take these four things and kind of throw them into the courtyard. Um, where they're being prepared to, again, go into the temple and initiate. Um, we could look at some of the prophetic material as well, where you have um, Jeremiah mentioning the Lord touched his mouth in his call narrative. Um, or Enoch mentioning that his eyes, he put clay in his eyes and he washed away the clay so he could see spiritual things in the book of Moses, chapter 6, 7, something like 7, 6, 6. So, uh, and then also, Enoch was told by God, open your mouth. He said it literally that way. Open your mouth and I'll fill it, right, with words of power. And you can have great effect. You can move mountains with your words, right? And so we have this notion of Enoch having his mouth open and his eyes open. And again, uh, uh, Jeremiah having his, his mouth touched, or Isaiah having his <coughs> mouth touched with hot coal, right? So there's a lot of mouth opening going on in the prophetic material. Echoing what happens, I think, to those uh, those uh, 
priests in the book of Exodus in the court. All right? We can take this second group, a third group here then, and kind of link them to the holy place. Um, the second sensing would be kind of akin to crossing this threshold that we follow down in Milner's arguments that sensing is, is a liminal or transition moment, right? So we, and by the way, I forgot to mention this, there's three sensings in the temple of Israel. We do have record of that, um, and I've indicated them in my paper, but you do have sensing incense offerings out here, and then you have, of course, the altar of incense, and then on the Day of Atonement, they take incense into the Holy of Holies, so you have three incense burnings in the Israelite temple, just as you have three incense burnings in the, uh, in the uh, Egyptian ritual, perhaps again suggesting this progression and movement. I mentioned the final sensing uh, is a more, you know, more pure, high, great, big sensing is what they refer to. Um, okay. We also have a table of bread and and. Kings tell us, tells us that this table has all kinds of instruments, you know, on it, plates and bowls and jars. So this is a feast. As opposed to the ironic feast in the, in the courtyard around the sacrificial altar, right, and the, and the meat and the bread that was offered here, we now have a grander feast, it's a Melchizedek feast, I'm suggesting, um, that, that has other significance to it. Um, and it relates to this great meal offering, I believe, in the Egyptian accounts. And then, of course, we have... Uh, the high priest's differences in clothing versus the priest's clothing in the courtyard. So the plain clothes of the priest and the high priest with all of his regalia signifying or kind of echoing the insignia clothing that we have here. All right. Um, all right, the final grouping. Oops. I think that was a, probably a problem in my... I won't highlight it because it will move on. That last grouping there... Uh, or the final rituals, and um, and again, uh, probably the bringing the foot and reversion we could probably include in, in the uh, uh, the lower ones because it's, it's the what you do at the end of all the offerings after the meal, right? After you offered the meal, you, the priest in Israel, of course, took the the showbread out and they distributed it among the priests. They took the meat and it was offered, you know, in the courtyard. And they distributed it, and, they, and so the same things happening in ancient Israel were to take the food out and redistribute it um, to the people. Same things happening here. Then um, you have a final washing, um, and again, I can't help but think there's some kind of a progression going on here. We have initial washing, and then a final washing, and then you have this final, uh, you know, again libation and sensing, uh, which kind of closes everything down. And then you have those last two, and um, and we don't really get much about this in the Old Testament. What happens in the Holy of Holies, right? We don't get a lot of detail. We do some, get some detail, but but um, it's the Restoration Scriptures that gives more indication of what's going on there. Right? It's Joseph Smith uh, letting us know that, that there is, um, you know, a, uh, you, you can, if you obtain the fullness, right, of the priesthood, the fullness of powers, have power over your enemies. So the smashing the red bear, suggesting this, you have power over all your enemies and they can't harm you, uh, I think equates to that idea of, you know, JST, Genesis 14, where Melchizedek, receives the order of the Son of God, wherein he has power to move mountains now, and he has power to divide the seas, and all those kinds of things. So this idea of having power, or as the Book of Mormon helps us, you know, the sealing powers, um, you can kind of tie all those things together here as a concluding moment of the Egyptian temple uh, sequence that comes from pre-Abrahamic days. All right, so, conclusion. The above are just a few points of comparison between the temple rituals of an early period in Egyptian history with the scriptural tradition concerning temple worship among the early patriarchs and those descendants who preserved it. It is hoped that these comparisons increase awareness of the similarities between these two cultures from a very early period and provide an additional cultural comparison and contrast in order to deepen understanding of Old Testament temple worship. Further, it is hoped that the complexity of the early Egyptian ritual program dating from 2600 to 2100 BC and its similarity to scriptural traditions concerning Old Testament worship reveals just how complex the Old Testament temple rites could actually be at a very early date, calling into question some assumptions of modern scholars concerning the dating and nature of early Old Testament temple worship in 